Now, please go with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 real quick. Uh, this is where we're going to start tonight. Uh, we could pretty much start anywhere talking about God's goodness. Uh, but I try to show you uh, particulars like last week I shared with you about how God is a planner. And uh, God also has a place for you guys. And we're not going to talk about the place tonight. But there are different facets of understanding him that help you uh, to walk with him and to follow him and to seek after him with your whole heart. And that's what's absolutely necessary. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, you guys there by now? Come, come, come. We need you to get over here, okay? Hebrews chapter 11. Now again, when we're talking about God's goodness, we're talking about that which is available for everybody, but God is always looking for a receiver because a lot of people do not put themselves in the place to receive uh, from the Lord. They talk about uh, what, the, what others have received from God. They talk about what they've heard that others have received from God. Uh, there are many people that even can quote the sentences of the Bible and believe, and believe that they know uh, God and they know God's goodness based on those particulars. Uh, but to know God's goodness, you have to get intimate with God. And that does not just happen because you know scriptures or you go to a certain church or you prayed in tongues well, for five hours or whatever. Uh, the, the revelation of God's secrets, they come through those that are intimate with God and those that God is intimate with. And so tonight, you know, let's look at some things to help you. And I, I always look at these things to help me. But I know that these are things that will help you also to identify where you are so that you may want to change what you've been doing uh, so that you can get another result. Um, walking with God is something that's most important to all of us as Christians, but it is not a walk of just reading paper and looking at what ink says. It is an encounter. It is a relationship. It is a development of everyday big things and little things, the involvement of God in those things with you. It's a relationship, all right? A relationship, not a conversation, a relationship, okay? In Hebrews chapter 11, all right, my wife is over there. She's doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, verse 6, okay? And for you guys that are out there and you're watching on, uh, you know, you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on our channel, uh, our website, uh, you know, I invite you to listen to this because, and then take this in, and this is not a condemnation because God doesn't condemn us, all right? Uh, those that are in Christ Jesus, he doesn't condemn us. Uh, he, Jesus never condemned people when he came and walked on the earth. He doesn't condemn people. The word that's settled above God's name, that word is the instruction of, for everybody, okay? And you choose to follow or not to follow, okay? And that is what brings on the particular judgments, uh, whether you're going to walk under a curse or walk under a blessing. It's how you choose to accept what God has already given and then uh, decide to do that, okay? Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, come with me, all right? And we're going to look at this in another scripture tonight to help you to understand why it's so important to get involved in the relationship with God so that the things that he's always desired for you to have, that those things might come into your life. In verse 6, Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. Okay? For he that cometh to God, all right, must believe that he is, and that's not the only part, all right? But that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Now that word diligently seek him there, okay? There are a couple of Hebrew words. One of them is doresh, D-O-R-E-S-H. And, and it simply means to diligently inquire into the things of God so that I might know God, okay? Now, 
I want you to write this down because this is, this is kind of, uh, I, I would say a news flash to some people. Some people are uh, super Christians. They already know this. Uh, but this is for you. And this is what you need to know about walking with God. All right. And this is, and you can find this over in First, Corinth, First Chronicles uh, chapter 16, verse 11. If I'm going to entrust myself to God, all right, it says, those what without faith it's impossible to, to please him, for they that cometh to God must believe that he is, all right? If I'm going to entrust myself to God, okay, this is the way I have this, I must, believe, I must be aware of what that means. Again, if I'm going to entrust myself to God, I must be aware of what it means to entrust myself to God, okay? It's the same thing that when, you, when you're going to get married. You know, man, man and woman, not man and man or woman and woman. I'm not one of those preachers that will tell you, well, it's okay. No, it's not okay, all right, for a man and a man to marry or a woman and a woman to marry, okay? It's not okay. Biblically, Speaking, and that's God, okay? God has said that's not something that's allowed. So you break spiritual law, and breaking spiritual law brings you instant death, okay? Just ask Aaron's sons about breaking spiritual law and what happened to them, okay? Spiritual law will get you uh, out of here real fast, okay? Now, what I just said to you is what relates to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, okay, and that he's reward of those that diligently seek him. So if I'm going to walk in the goodness of God, okay, then I must be aware of my, I must know myself. What is this, what's, what is this going to cost? All right, all right. I need to know myself. What does it involve in following God? Because there's a lot of false messages out there to tell you all kinds of things. And we're not going to talk about those. I'm not going to waste the time to talk about those. But there are a lot of messages that talk about certain things that are not biblical. And they don't follow the scripture. And as a Christian, if I'm going to walk in the good things of God, if those, the unlimited goodness of God, as we talked about last week, if those things are going to lay on my life, you know, and I'm, we're going to look at a scripture in a moment that describes those particular things to you. If those things are going to lay on my life, and I'm believing God for these things to walk in so that I can take God's goodness. See, my joy comes from seeing God do things that people said wouldn't happen. That's where my real joy comes from. And seeing him, this is why we have this church, all right, is seeing God do things uh, because there are so many people that go to church and they sing songs and hymns and all kinds of things, but they are not, they do not, I'm telling you, and you've seen it, and it's, it's a, it becomes a, a, an iniquitous pattern in the, people, in, the, in the lives of Christian people to say they believe in God but never receiving anything, all right? There's a blockage there, okay, all right, from generation to generation, and people begin to work on their own plans and do their own worldly things, and they say, well, the Lord did this, or the Lord did that, and whatever, you know, and there's no root of God in that, okay? Now, this is what I'm sharing with you guys. If I'm going to entrust myself to God, okay, I'm going to believe what he says. I'm going to get into covenant with God. I'm going to take the scriptures, and I'm going to say, God said this, Luke 6, 38, if you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. All right, men are going to give into my bosom. So I have to be aware, okay, of what that means to me because God already knows what it means to him, okay? I must be aware of what it means to get involved. I'm going to entrust my life to God, to these scriptures, to follow the word of God because I want the goodness of God to be in my life. I want it to be in my family's life. You do the same thing. Everybody does, okay? But again, I must be aware of what it means and what is it going to entail in my life that I have to do and, and to get these things happening in my life, okay? Now, you've heard me say over and over and over tonight that there are people that 
they know the scriptures. They come, they come to church. People come to church all the time, all over the world. Uh, and why isn't so many days of heaven on earth as we have up in here? Why, why aren't there so many open heaven days on earth happening in people's lives? Uh, well, come on, go meet them to Matthew chapter 5. Let me show you something, okay? Now, this is Bible study, all right? And, I, and, you know, and I may jump up and down in a moment and holler and hoop and do something wild like you do at home. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, okay? But, uh, I mean, John chapter 5. But you're going to have to understand this, that there are many people that do not diligently seek God's face, okay? They don't diligently. When I say diligently, uh, that means that every day, you're digging, and if you find something, you dig a little more. And every day when you discover light, guess what? You want the bulb to turn on, maybe, you know, a few more lumens, uh, you know, brighter. You want to, uh, you know, get away from those old light bulbs and get into the LCDs, whatever you want. You want more light. You want more revelation. See, and, and God knows when you're digging deeper. He knows when you're diligently after, the, after him so that you'll be aware of what he requires of you, okay? In, in, in John chapter 5, and this is Jesus making a, a statement uh, because there are a lot of people that have an ink and, and paper relationship with God, but they do not have a, a heart relationship with God, okay? And this is what Jesus says, Matthew, John chapter 5. Must be something wonderful over in the book of Matthew because I keep talking about the book of Matthew. And it is something wonderful, but, you know, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, in verse, um, here we go. Verse 39. Now, this is Jesus having uh, a heated debate with some of the Pharisees and all these people all the time. They're always on him, he said. Uh, verse 38, he says, and you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent, him you believe not. And then he makes this statement. He says, search the scriptures. Because that's what they always did. All right. For in them you think you have eternal life. He says, and they are they which testify of me. All right. Now he's talking about the word and he's telling them that guess what? Oh, you search the scriptures. But then look at what he says in the next verse. You will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, you, you search the scriptures, but you don't have any relationship with me. This is what he's saying, all right? See, you can search the scriptures just like the Pharisees did, but it does not necessarily mean that you have a relationship with the Lord. Okay? And in order to have a relationship with the Lord, again, we must believe that he is that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him, see? And you have to stay on that and draw a circle around you and say, I'm not getting off God's word until something supernatural happens, see? There's going to be a persistence. There's going to be an, a diligence, a persistence about you and your walk with God if you're going to see God's goodness the way you really want to see it. Now, you know, guess what? Everybody, everybody runs under the waterfall of somebody else every now and then. You know, somebody's believing for certain things to happen and the atmosphere get filled up with that. You know, open heaven comes. God wants to pour that blessing, that revelation on whoever's been believing for that thing. And somebody sticks their head under the water spout, you know, and they get wet also. And they say, oh, man, praise the Lord. I got a blessing or whatever. Well, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. All right. The blessing of the Lord. That's the word. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. And so we have to... Be real with ourselves and make sure that I understand that even though I know the scripture, okay, but has it become a relationship to me that every day that scripture is like a friend that I get up and talk to? That scripture is like a buddy that I hold hands with and we play ball or whatever and I can count on him to, to do what he's supposed to do in this particular you know, we playing ball. I'm counting on my buddy over there to do what he's supposed to do. Well, this is the way God wants you to have a heart toward his word. That his word is like that friend of yours that's running around with him. You know, I got your back, man, or whatever. See, you're building a relationship with him now because Jesus said, why call me Lord and do not obey the things or do the things that I say do? Why, why call me Lord? I have no relationship with you. 
So as Lord, I can't get any goodness to you from myself because guess what? You don't even trust yourself to trust me. See? You don't trust yourself, okay? See, this is why when people dream and have, they have big dreams and some people can't understand, how can you dream like that? Why you say something like that? So I've even seen people get upset when you talk about believing God for big things and whatever. I've seen them get upset, bent out of shape, because guess what? Their minds are so far from a relationship with the Lord that they have no light from him regarding the thing that you're talking about. And so immediately, guess what? Darkness encounters whatever they're hearing to shroud so that they will never believe that thing from God. See? Call invasive spirits, all right? And so you and I, we should always look for God's goodness to work for us and to believe for God's goodness to work for us because we have a relationship. When I, when I read the Word of God, you know, it's like a friend talking to me or a friend showing me something that I didn't see, you know. It's like a close friend telling me, man, listen, we got this deal over at the store. Come get this. It's like, it's like you know, this is the relationship that Jesus wants with us. That's why Peter asked John, he says, listen, ask him who it is. Who's going to betray us? Why? Because Peter knew that John had a heart relationship with Jesus, more so than he had. So he asked him, he says, ask him, you know, like, like a good buddy, ask him, all right? And this is what Jesus is saying. You search the scriptures. They were always in the scriptures. They were always saying, oh, it's not good to do this on this day, or you shouldn't do this. Oh, they had that, that scripture thing down but they had no relationship with him. He said so. He says, search the scriptures in them. You think you have eternal life and for they which testify me and you will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, you're avoiding the relationship because you think you know the word. But there is no knowing the word without the relationship. Are you guys with me? And so when we, when we read these particular things, Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. You know, when we read those things, it's because again of the relationship that was there that he's showing you and I how to walk every day in relationship with God, in relationship with the Holy Spirit so that the relationship causes things to happen in our lives. One of the things that you need to know is that your wallet may have a bad economy going on. Your, your city that you live in may not have any money. You know, uh, your bank account may have had a no-show day for you. Uh, there are all kinds of things about the economy of the world that can go, you know, like this, but there is no lack of resources in the kingdom of God. And when you start looking at the Word of God and you start depending on the resources to come out of the kingdom of God, and not out of this thing or that thing or this thing or that thing. When you start looking at this, then you have a relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is Lord of heaven and Lord of earth, okay? And he has now the ability, because of the relationship, to direct things to you, to connect things to you, you know, so that you may receive those things that you're believing for. But without the relationship, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be no manifestation of the blessings of Almighty God, the goodness of God that's unlimited. And it is unlimited, but he has to have a receiver. See, because it does not say in Hebrews, all who come to the Lord will receive everything they need and whatever. No, he says, he that cometh to the Lord must believe that he is. See, you must believe that he is, and then you add this to it. And he's a reward of those who, again, diligently seek him. Not just open up the scripture and look at it and go, well, the word says this, and I'm going to quote the word. Well, again, you, you're doing the same thing that the Pharisees did. They searched the scriptures. Jesus said they did. You search the scriptures, but guess what? You won't come to me that you might have life. See, you can search the scriptures, but you still got to come to the Lord so that he can explain. So that when you have that scripture, then a situation rolls up and you got a buddy in your back pocket. And you pull out your buddy and you say, oh, no, by his stripes I'm healed. And your buddy said, I'm in agreement with you, buddy. We're going to stand together. Two shall agree. Your buddy's agreeing with you. This is the way the relationship with the Word of God is. And so your economy and any other condition, guess what? It weakens until it falls apart at the, at the, at the hearing 
of the word of God. It begins to crumble. It begins to say, I'm temporary, that's permanent. So I must decrease and he must increase. This is the power of God's goodness. All right, you guys with me tonight? Come on, go with me too. Oh, since we're here in the book of John, let's go over to the book of Luke. Just back up a little bit. Luke chapter 13. Now, we, again, we're talking about the goodness of God. And it is unlimited. There is no condition. There is no season. There is no age thing. There is nothing that can hinder the goodness of God. All right? In the raising of Lazarus from the grave after four days shows us the unlimited goodness of God. All right? Man and all of his technology cannot perform that. The body is decaying. The brain has stopped. It is cold. It is functionalist. It's lifeless. Everything is done. The blood is become poison now in the body. Everything is decaying. Cells are filled with inflammation. Everything is decaying. And Jesus walks there and he calls the man. And, he, and, and the thing about it, you have to know this. He did not want them to just think that somebody just got up. He asked them to remove the stone so that those that were looking into the cave could see that dead man get up and come out again. That's the goodness of God. And his whole body was healed. All right. It didn't say he had to learn how to walk. He didn't have to learn languages again. Everything about his faculties came back alive the same way that he's supposed to be in every man. And this is the power of God. So God's goodness is never limited to your circumstances. It is only limited by the receiver. See, if you block him out, he can want to do everything for you that he want to do for you, but he can't do it because you're blocking him out. And I've seen people that are so stingy, people that don't believe in God and, and healing, they can read it right in the word, you know, but they have no relationship with it. And they can quote it. Oh, I know the Lord heals. But you have no relationship with that. Well, I know the Lord is good, but you, why ain't he doing some good for you? <laughs> you know, this is what I'm saying. We have to get away from this because those things build iniquitous patterns in your life and your children come up the same way and your children and your grandchildren, whatever, they come up in the same kind of mindset believing that God don't do this or God's a taker. He's a thief or he's an Indian giver, as people used to say. He'll give you something, then he'll take it away and all the same. You, you don't know God to say things like that about him. And how do you know him? Again, I just gave it to you. I must entrust myself to him. If I'm going to know him, I must entrust myself to him. Other than that, I'm not going to know him. Again, it's like a marriage. A husband, a man, and a wife. They get married. They entrust themselves to each other so that they might know each other. Well, you have to do the same thing. You have to entrust yourself to God. Is it hard when you first start doing this and things are, you know, everything, it seems like every day you got to walk out and throw your shield of faith up because fiery dots are coming from the north, south, and you throw them up this way and it seems like something hits you in the back, you know? And if you're looking this way and you're looking around, something falls on you, you know? It, it's, sometimes it can be like that when you first start. But the more and more that you draw that relationship and God shows up on the battlefield, the less your enemy wants to come on the battlefield. See, the more he shows up, your enemy going like, boys, let's stay home today. No need going out there getting whipped up on the day. Let's stay home today. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, okay? Luke chapter 13. It says this, verse 10. This is Jesus. Again, all through the Gospels, you can read it from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Old covenant, new covenant. The word of God is still the same. He's just given us better promises. We, we look at this and he says, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. You know how long 18 years is? That's from the time your little baby was born until the time they get ready to leave home and say, I'm going off to school now. Or I'm going off to do my own thing or whatever. 18 years. 
This woman has been bent over 18 years. And it says she was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. So she had no physical strength to fight this thing. No physical strength to even lift herself up. All right? No physical strength. She was, she was powerless against this particular spirit. Okay? And it says, when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself and he said, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. All right? She'd had it so long, she believed that she was going to be like that. He called it your infirmity, thine infirmity. And it says, and he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. In other words, he cast the spirit out, and then he laid his hands on her. And when he laid his hands on her, her whole backbone straightened up the way it should have been. All right? And she stood up straight. Okay? So she made straight and said, everybody in there start glorifying. And, and here, here we go with these, these religious people that don't believe in the goodness of God or don't want to see the goodness of God done unless it's done the way they want it done. Okay? And I've seen a lot of this in the church in the years that we've been pastoring. That there are people that want certain things, but they want it the way they want it. They don't want it the way God wants to bring it so that God can get the glory. They want it so that they can brag about it and say, this is what I did and this happened. All right? It says, the rule of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. All right? Now, you'll notice that the woman didn't fight getting healed. I'm not seeing anybody fight that got healed from Jesus. All right? It's the, it's the other people. All right? The ones that don't want to see God's goodness. All right? Because they're not believing for it, so they don't want to see other people walk in it. Okay? And you, you think that there aren't people like that around you, but I'll tell you something. There are people around you every day like that, okay? They don't want to see you say, oh, man, you know, because your priority when God blesses you is to say who did it for you. They don't want to hear you saying, man, God bless my kids. You know, God bless my job, man. You know, man, God bless me to get a new car. Oh, mercy. What's wrong with the other one? Or, or people will say this. How much did that set you back? That's crazy. The kingdom of God is never a setback. It's always going forward. It's always increasing. All right? So, so the blessings of God don't set you back. It says the ruler answered and said with indignation, because Jesus said heal on the Sabbath day. He said unto the people. Now, he's trying to down Jesus now. All right? There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, <laughs> in them, therefore, what, what them? The six days. Uh, they ought to come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Well, this lady been like this for 18 years and y'all ain't said none to her. What about all those six days in every week for 18 years? How many days was that? All right. In all those years. And, and the Lord answered and said, he called him a hypocrite. Oh, boy. Right out in front of everybody, the Lord called him a hypocrite. In other words, you're an actor. You're acting like you want the things of God done, but you really don't want them done. You're an actor, okay? So like people that, you know, the hypocrites that fill places and they do the same thing. They act like they're doing this, but they really don't. They're not, they're not wanting the Holy Spirit to come on them and the power of God to start dealing with them and showing them, listen, get that sin out. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the way that a lot of Christians dress when they come to church would show you where they are, all right? It shows you. When you get a little older, there are certain things that you need to do based on wisdom. You shouldn't, you know, you, you, you're weighing 300 pounds and you're wearing um, uh, tight shirts and tight dresses. There's certain things that, that, that are common to the wisdom of God that you need to dress in, dress like where you're going. If I'm going before God, then I dress to honor God. I don't dress to dishonor everybody else's husband or everybody else's wife. You don't do that. that that's, again, we're talking about growing up in the Holy Spirit. And somebody's going like, why are you saying that? Well, it might be somebody on here tonight that need to hear that, okay? Because maybe you need to train, change your dress code, okay? But let's get back to this so that you can get this because the goodness of God is shared here with Jesus showing you and I how God is about things, okay? 
because of who you are, God believes that you deserve his goodness. See, he believes that. And, and, it's, and it's the Bible that's trying to get you to also believe with God that you should receive God's goodness. Okay? The Lord answered and said, you are a hypocrite. Do not each one of you on, your, on the Sabbath loose your ox and your ass from the stall and lead him away? Uh, is your ox or ass better than this woman? And he says, ought not this woman being a daughter, excuse me, a daughter of Abraham, who is God's friend? All right? Who is God's friend, whom Satan has bound? Shouldn't she be loose from this bond all these years? This is what he's saying. See, God believes that you should always have his goodness, regardless of the condition, regardless of the times, regardless of what has gone on, his mind and showing us this with Jesus is showing us that it does not matter how long you've been in something, it is always God's will for you to have his goodness, for you to be free, okay, and for you to walk in that. And this is what we're talking about tonight. But again, if I'm going to walk in these things, then I, as I said before, I must Know that if I'm going to entrust myself to him, all right, I must be aware of what it means. See, what does it mean to you to trust God? Does it mean, well, Lord, I'll do it when it's convenient? Does it mean, well, I'll do it if I can do it my way? See, what does it mean to you to say that you entrusting yourself to God? Okay, I can tell you, what it's going to mean if you do it, you're going to give up you. All right? That's what's going to happen. You're going to give up you. You're going to put him in a box one day, and you, don't, you ain't going to let him out no more. You know? That's what it's going to mean. So come on, go with me. Let's look at uh, one of the, the good things about God's goodness in uh, Genesis real quick. And you, you guys know I, I'm always kickler for Genesis. Uh, this is where we slang from, as Pastor JB says. The slang in the word. Genesis chapter 26. See, the goodness of God is not limited to conditions, as I said before. Your bank account, the economy of the state, uh, you know, pandemic, all these things, they have no bearing on God's goodness to you, all right? If you will, again, be aware of you, your entrusting yourself to God, be aware of what is it going to take for you to walk in these things with God? See, Because some people have a word thing, as the Pharisee said. The scripture says this, but do you have a relationship with God so that he can tell you when to use that scripture without just going around quoting scriptures, you know, all the time? When do you need that scripture? You know, when is that scripture right? In Genesis chapter 26, you ought to be there by now. God's goodness is unlimited. Now, I know somebody's out there watching this or somebody's going to watch this and they're going to say, well, if God's goodness is so unlimited, why is so much badness in the world? Why is so much this going on? Well, listen, honey, child, as they say in the country, don't you know that there's somebody else in this world working too? And he's working against all goodness. Don't you know that there's a devil in this world? There's a curse in this world. All right? Don't you know that that curse is working also? You know, that's a simple answer. God is in the world working to bring his goodness. But there's a devil in the world working to bring. He, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. See? So, so don't blame all the stuff on God. All right. Look at the real culprit who's doing the things and see how much murder is taking place and how much death is taking place because people are sinning and doing things. And the wages of sin has always been death. There's no change to that. It's always been that way. OK, look what it says here in the goodness of God. People are dying. Food is short. A drought is everywhere. And it says, Verse 12, Isaac sowed in that land. What land? It was a drought. Verse 1 says, and there was a famine. 
in the land. And he sowed. And look, look, check this out now. This is the goodness of God. All right? See, God's goodness, again, is not limited to conditions. Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him in the land of famine. People, people begging to, just to live. And this man is so blessed that God's blessing him a hundredfold. You know, just sowing, blessing him a hundredfold. See, when you, again, you have to entrust yourself to God that no matter what season is going on, like Psalms 91, when the pandemic first hit, you know, back about six, eight months ago or seven months ago, everybody you heard was talking about Psalm 91. I mean, you heard Psalm 91 spoken so much, you know, there was like people know what Psalms 91 means. Psalms 91 shows you the conditions of both kingdoms. It shows you the condition of God's goodness when you're living in his kingdom, and it shows you the conditions of the curse when you're living outside of God's kingdom, all right? And that psalm is not for unbelievers just quoting, you know, when I say unbelievers, I'm talking about people that are in the church that don't believe God, but when something happens, a condition happens, they want to, again, search the scriptures. In them you think you have life, and they talk about eternal life, and they talk about me, but you will not come to me that you may have life. See, the Word of God is, it's not, it's not a great mystery. If you dig diligently, that word Dorish, if you dig diligently, guess what? Then you'll know him, and then you'll be aware of who you're entrusting yourself to. And now because I'm entrusting myself to him, because I know him, I know how good he is. See, I know how good he is. I know how good my wife is. If I don't watch, if I send her to the store and say, oh, uh, you know, Pearl, pick up this for me, you know, get me this. She'll come back with two of this, two of that, and two of this, and she'll say, well, I thought you needed this one, well, I didn't know, but I know you like this one, you know, so I just bought them all. See, well, well this is what I'm talking about, when you know, and sometimes I tell her, listen, don't get this two or three, don't do, do that, because I know her. See, I'm aware of her, because we entrust ourselves to each other, so I know See, and this is the thing about walking in the goodness of God. You have to know how good God is so that you can trust him for his goodness. You have to know. Come on, go with me to Psalms 25. Psalms 25 is a psalm that a, a couple of scriptures in that particular psalm that I gave you guys to pray this week because I wanted you to focus on how good God is. And when you read that whole particular set of scriptures there, you see that this young man is crying out to God for this and that, and then he says, where is the man that feareth the Lord? And, and in, the, in the living translation, and again now, this is, uh, this is one of the, uh, I don't know if it's still this way in the, in the translations that you have in the living because they, you know, they upgrade whatever, but this is one that my wife bought, uh, she says, I don't know, many years ago, Life Application Bible, all right, Life Application. Many years ago, all right? Y'all see this? Life application. Somebody go like, oh, man, that's in the history books, life, life application. She bought this book many years ago. But it, that's right. It, she says, she's sitting over, she says, it's a Bible. But in Psalms 25, I want to read this to you out of this, this particular translation. And if you could get this, I'm telling you right now, it will wake you up, all right? Because, again, this particular psalmist is expressing what he knows about God, see, because the Holy Spirit allowed him this to be recorded. See, so this has to be truth about God because the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow him to write something that wasn't true about God, okay? All right, and he says this in the, in the verses that I ask you guys to read this week and pray. Verse 12, all right, where's the man who fears the Lord? All right, now again, this is, Reverence. This is commitment, okay? This is I am tied in to God, the man who fears God. He ain't going to do anything but, because he know God's watching him, listening to him, whatever. He, and this is not something that he's obeying out of law. He's obeying God out of heart, okay? Which is a, a great thing. This is the, 
the message that Jesus said. You search the scriptures, but you won't come to me. Your heart is not right. You won't come to me that you might live. He says this. Now, again, you can find this and read this. Maybe you got it in your smartphone. It's good. It's good. I have one. actually have one in my wallet that I pull out and I read. Where is the man who fears the Lord? God will teach him how to choose the best. God will teach you how to choose the best. You want to know why you, you like this instead of liking that? It's because the spirit of God in you, when you're reading the word, when you're spending time with God, he's telling you, no, 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 you don't want that. Go get that one. Well, and everybody's telling you, well, you, well, that one is fine, man. That'll be okay. But God is saying, but, and everybody's looking at you like, why you, why you think you ought to, and you're going like, well, I just want that one. But why? I don't, it just looks, I don't know, it just looks different. Something about it that I see that I really don't see with my physical eyes, but I just see. It's, it's, I just want that one. It's that good, that good thing. Yeah, people wonder, why you, why you, why you think you got to have that? Because my daddy want me to have it. He's teaching me to choose the best. All right? God will teach him to choose the best. But here comes some more. Check this out. Hmm. He shall live within God's circle of blessing. Say what? I'll say it again. If, if you'll translate, again, this is, a, this is a living Bible translation, you know, from my wife's day. All right? God will, he shall live within God's circle of blessing. Remember, Job, what Satan said? You put a hedge of protection around him, circle of blessings. You bless all that he set his hands to do. Remember that? The psalmist says, uh, you've encamped us with favor as a shield. Remember that? See, see the Bible knows, people know, and there, and there have been men and women that have known that God places a circle of blessing around you. Now, now, if there's a circle around you that's all blessing, no matter which way you turn, you're going to run into something good, as old Roberts used to say. Something good going to happen to you today, all right? You're going to run into something good because there's a circle around you. If you, if you fall backwards, a circle. If you try to crawl out of it, it's a circle. You can't find a corner. It's a circle. See? God, God puts you in a circle of blessing so that no matter where you go, the circle goes with you. You leave here and you go to South America, the circle goes to South America. Wherever you are, the circle of blessing is around you. You, you get some revelation of this, the goodness of God, it's going to wake you up. Because God needs you now in this time to understand that it is his goodness that men need to see. It says this, we're not over yet, watch this. And his children shall inherit the earth. In other words, God's saying, I'll put a circle around you and your children, guess what? They're going to get all the overflow from that circle around you to the day that I put a circle around them. They shall inherit the earth. What's in the earth? The silver, the gold, the oil. What's in the earth? The world of currency, the world of the fish, the world of the animals, the world of everything, all those different worlds. They shall inherit. See? And God has placed everything within the ability of his goodness because he's all good. He has to, all he has is good. And he brings that to us. And then he says this, and I love this part. And this is what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. And it's what I'm saying to you tonight. All right? He says, friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence him. Friendship with God. You heard Pastor Milton talking about friendship Sunday a little bit. Friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence God. See? And then he says this. With them alone, he shares the secrets of his promises. 
See, you want to know how to get that promise to work in your life? You want to know how to pull that off the page and have it in your pocket so that he's your best friend all day long? You know, years ago when we first started this ministry, I had scriptures that I wrote that I knew that I would speak every day, and I had them inside my shoes that everywhere I went to, that scripture was with me, those particular scriptures were with me in my shoe everywhere I went because I believed that every place that soles of my feet tread upon, that God had given that to me. And I would speak it and talk about it and say those things every day until those things got in my heart to the point that those things stood there with me wherever I was. Those were the things that started me telling people years ago, how you doing, young lady? How you doing, young man? And today I have so many people, when you say that, they'll stop. Uh, what did you say? They want to hold a conversation with you, you know, because you, you're speaking life. Because in my shoes, I had, I'm a speaker of life. I am a giver of life. I speak life. I receive life. I sow life. Guess what? I'm going to reap life. All these particular things. And God is saying through his word, and you read this, that if you reverence him, if you're living in his circle of blessings, He'll reveal the secrets of his promises to you. Is not that what he did with Job? And when he came and talked to Job, and he says, Job, you don't know anything about me. You're sitting here talking all this stuff. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Yeah, <laughs> Job started wringing his hands. <laughs> he says, I'm going to ask you a few questions, Job. You know, but then what did God do? He says, Job, go pray for your friends. And he says, and after Job prayed for his friends, it says God restored to him twice as much as he had before. See, God's goodness is not limited because you lost this or lost that. God restored to him twice as much as he had before. I've got to stop here. Uh, I don't have to, but I am uh, because I want this to sit in your heart. Psalms 25. I want that to set in your heart tonight. Same thing Jesus told the Pharisees. You have no relationship with me. You're, not, you are, you are, you're running away from the relationship because you think you know the scriptures. Never run away from the presence and the power and the encounters of God because you know a few scriptures. See, the important thing is to know him and he can help you to understand the scriptures. All right? God bless you guys. I hope this, uh, you know, I've got a whole lot of other stuff to talk about this, and that's why I don't want to get into that because we'll be going for another 15 or 20 minutes tonight. But it doesn't matter about the economy. What matters is that you understand God's unlimited goodness. There is no shortage in the kingdom. Jesus showed Peter that. When Peter was asked, does your master pay the temple tax? Peter boldly spoke up. You know, you know how Peter is. He boldly spoke up because he knew Judas was a thief. They all knew Judas was a thief. But, but, but Peter was he, was, he was covering his master. And when they asked him, they said, does your master pay the temple tax? He says, yes, he does. And, then, and Jesus heard the whole conversation. Not where Peter was, but he heard it. Just like he hear your conversation. And so when Peter comes to the house, Jesus asks him a question before Peter could say anything. And so Jesus sends him to a place where Peter is sort of familiar with, but his methods are not familiar with casting a hook. His methods were casting a net. So Jesus calls him to trust him. All right. Again, here we come back. Do you entrust yourself with what God says? And so Jesus said, go and cast a hook. The first fish to come up, open his mouth and take out the coin and pay the tax for, you know, you and me. All right. It totally bummed Peter out because Peter had answered, you know, prematurely because they, all of them knew that Judas was a thief and he, was a, he used to take what was in the bag. So why would Jesus have to send him to get a coin? Because he didn't have it in his treasury because he had a thief there. All right. So there is no shortage in the kingdom. Jesus was showing Peter this. Peter, I don't really live on the resources that you want to live on, but I will show you how the kingdom operates. So, see, the kingdom always has resources. 
And when you start putting your trust in the kingdom resources, again, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. Then God is showing us that even if the economy of the nation or the city or your wallet or your bank or your job, even if those things go down, God has always got more than enough to take care of you. That's God's unlimited goodness. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being on tonight. Uh, you know, I pray you guys get something out of this. I pray you'll, you'll open up your eyes and ask God to help you to see more and more about his goodness so that those things may be in agreement with your life every day. For the attributes of the law, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's the day that God has made for you. This is the day that the Lord has made. And every day I stand up and I say, Lord, I thank you for divine acceleration. I thank you for open doors, divine open doors, divine opportunities and invitations, you know, divine health, wellness, and a sound mind, divine increase. You know, every day I have my list of things that I speak over me, my family, my, this ministry, and our businesses, and whatever else we set our hands to do. Every day I thank him because those attributes under the law of the spirit of life is what keeps us free from living under the law of sin and death. Amen. God bless you guys.